So, Juan Ramon, we find ourselves uh, here um, talking cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Why is it this year that cybersecurity that is continuing to be at the top of uh, executive and C level agendas? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, hi everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity. There is there is one quote. Uh, it's very famous in the in the cybersecurity uh, community, which says something like um, the only it is something like the only truly secure system is a system that is powered off, is cast in a block of concrete, and is sealed in a in a room protected by armed guards. And even there. And I have my doubts. This, this is from Gene Spayford. Okay. So, um, so what is the situation now? The situation now is that financial industry and all industries, they have a huge dependency on technology. Okay. They rely on te technological infrastructures to support their business, but also to interact with customers, with suppliers, with partners. Okay. So obviously, any attack on the infrastructure technology could be extremely damaging. For any industry, okay, in terms of uh, financial losses, it could be reputational damage, it could be disruption of business, or even you know loss of uh, confidential or intellectual uh, information, okay. But in any case, it all comes to uh, actually to to, to uh, a risk management uh, game, okay. So it all comes to the sense of risk, okay. And uh, the reality is that nowadays, at least in the, fi in the financial uh, industry. The sense of risk is quite is quite large, and that's why you know cybersecurity is nowadays there at the uh, C level and, and board level, and it's you know topping their their agendas. But um, so let me give you some some context, okay? So where where the problem uh, comes from? The thing is that um, when we say that uh, you know the financial industry uh, it depends on technological infrastructure. We're talking basically about computer systems and uh, network communications. Okay, computer systems are complex systems. Okay, uh, they start. They're based on, the, um, if you know it, the, the von Neumann architecture. Okay, which is uh, the it's like the basics or the foundations of the computer systems. Uh, it is something that was designed in the 1945, so decades ago. Okay, but it is like the foundation foundation of how computers work. Starting from you know the base architecture of processor memory instructions stored on memory executed by the processor interaction with external devices okay obviously this is all very low level this is all very complex okay so um, on top of this uh, we started to build different layers different abstraction layers to let's say simplify the things okay so that's when for instance the operating system uh, comes into place the operating system is something that will hide you from the complexity of the low levels by creating some abstractions like the process system, the file system, uh, the memory systems, et cetera, et cetera. This will allow somebody to create applications. Okay? So we have programming languages that make use of these operating system abstractions okay, to create an application for a business purpose. Okay? And even in the application, we have multiple layers, and we have libraries and reuse of code, et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line is that the full thing is so complex okay, that you need these abstraction layers to be able to do high value uh, you know, uh, business applications. And the reality is that you're losing contact with how the things really work. Okay? And uh, you know, the, the, the bad news is that you know, technology is made by humans. And humans are not that good at uh, you know, dealing with complex things. Okay? And they make mistakes. And when you make a mistake, and the mistake can make, uh, let's say, an attacker get access and get control of a system, okay? in cybersecurity, we call this a vulnerability. Okay? Vulnerabilities have always been there and will always be there. Okay, and they can be exploited, and they can be exploited to get access and control of a system. Okay, so let's say we are into a, um, a bit of a difficult situation. The other point, uh, which is also critical, is uh, the dependence on the network communications. Okay, so every system nowadays needs to be connected to uh, to everywhere. Okay, and again, this is based into. Um, 
uh, the TCP IP protocol, which is the foundation of the internet, which is something that was designed in the early 70s. Okay? And when they designed the TCP IP protocols, they were not thinking about security. They were thinking about reliability, right? The fact that any two computers anywhere in the world can connect to each other in a fast and reliable way, uh, independently of you know, the congestion level of the network, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody thought that somebody might try to impersonate uh, an end to connect to another end. Okay? And that's why afterwards you need to build you know, extra things like uh, you know, the TLS, which is based on cryptography and all that stuff. Okay? So let's say that from a technological point of view, uh, that is a, a difficult situation. Obviously, the thing is this in the past used to be just a technological issue, a technological problem. Okay? But what happened? What happened is that, let's say in the late 90s, uh, early 2000, okay, there started to appear some uh, threat actors, as we call them, okay, which thought, oh, if I can you know, take benefit from and exploit these vulnerabilities, I might get access to critical systems, infrastructures, and I may benefit from it. So I can make a profitable business out of it. And that's when the problems start to, to, to appear. Okay. So uh, you talked about problems starting to appear. So today, like, what, what's the current sort of threat environment look like? What are the main types of attacks that are seeing? Which ones are maybe trending upwards or, or indeed yeah. downwards at the moment? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, defining or classifying the cybersecurity attacks is like, a, you know, it's like, a, it's like a big task. Okay. Um, I usually like to. Uh, um, I usually what I like to do is is to look at the threat actors. Okay, so what they do, what are their motivations, what are their objectives, and what are their techniques or tactics. Okay, and uh, actually this leads to the uh, let's say a good classification of uh, of cyber attacks that, that I like, which is based on the threat actors. Uh, you can classify cyber attacks in non-structured, structured. structured or highly structured attacks. Okay? The non-structured attacks are, this is what I, what I call the, the lonely rider. Okay? Non-structured means that the threat actor, the attacker, it's an individual or a small group with uh, little to no structure okay? and small funding. Usually, they, um, the, 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 the attacks are opportunistic attacks. Okay? So they're not targeted attacks. They go against the general public or the weakest link, okay? And usually the techniques uh, that they use are not sophisticated, okay? They use maybe uh, out of the box, uh, you know, attack tools, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at it from the um, uh, perspective of the financial institutions and the self-service channel, uh, this is the kind of attacks that uh, uh, can be made with, uh, you know, these malware kits that you can buy from the darknet for a few hundred of dollars. And then you can use that to empty or jackpot the ATM. Uh, and I'm talking about the Alice or the Cutlet Maker uh, malware kits. Okay. And obviously, this is one, uh, let's say, one threat actor, okay? the non-structure. Then we have the structured uh, attack, so the structured um, threat actor. And in this case, we're talking about organized crime. Okay? So organized crime means, obviously, actors that have um, a decent uh, organization and structure, okay? normally hierarchical, with different levels and different functions, including uh, R&D, including operations, including uh, a connection with mules. Okay? And um, usually, they, uh, they target specific objectives, okay? So when they plan an attack, it is a full process. And the attack has different phases, okay? From uh, what is called the reconnaissance or the development or specific tools for the attack, the initial access, the lateral movement, the execution, ev evasion of the defenses, exfiltration, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a whole complex uh, uh, attack and you know these organizations are well funded okay because the attacks pay for themselves okay uh in in here we will be talking now about uh for instance in the self service the infamous cobalt or carbonic attacks that were you know hitting european institutions uh, a few years back 
and they were compromising the internal network, building like an internal botnet, uh, moving laterally to the systems that control the ATMs, deploying the malware, executing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, so obviously, it's a it's a very sophisticated attack. Okay, but the investment pays off. Okay, so that was the non-structure, the lonely rider, the structure, which is the um, uh, the organized crime. There is yet another level, which is the highly structured uh, threat actors. In this case, we're talking about nation states. Okay? Nation states, um, obviously, they are on the top of uh, funding and resources. So they have uh, unlimited funding and unlimited resources if the objective or if the target is worth it. Okay? And they have, uh, obviously, complex organizations with intelligence services, but also making use of, uh, let's say, hiring services of uh, specialized black hat hackers or black hat uh, groups, okay? Um, in terms of uh, technologies, they use the, you know, the, the, the edge technologies, the state of the art. In many cases, uh, they even hire, uh, you know, specialists to develop a specific malware and, um, um, and even, you know, this, um, so they, they use the, the, the technologies that are most, more sophisticated. Even they make use of what is called the, the zero-day vulnerabilities. Zero-day vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities that are not known to the non uh, common public or to the cybersecurity community. So they just buy them like in the black market for, you know, uh, millions of dollars. And they have like a cyber weapon where they can attack uh, using those vulnerabilities that are not known. Okay. Obviously, nation states, uh, if you're targeted by a na nation state, uh, you are in deep trouble. <laughs> okay. uh, nation states, the motivations for, for the attacks are basically more in, in, um, in the sense of uh, dominance, okay? cyber espionage, cyber war, etc., etc. So a nation state will not go after the cash. Okay? It will go after the service it will try to disrupt the service, disrupt, in the case of uh, ATMs, an essential service to the community, okay? They will just disrupt it, okay? And completely block it. Uh, so that's like a different uh, situation. And as it relates to, to the banking sector, are you seeing these, these attacks from, from state actors become like, more frequent, more, more severe? Are they, are they different in, some, in any other way than, than the other types of attack, attackers and, and yeah. threats? I mean, I mean, usually, as I was saying, the, the, the nation state, uh, the, these state actors are usually involved in the, what is called the hybrid war. Okay? Now, now the war is, is uh, let's say, it's battled in, in, in two different fields, which is the physical war and the cyber war. Okay? And usually they target the critical infrastructures. Okay? And uh, mainly, for instance, the energy system. So there's been uh, the, the first, let's say, uh, widely known attack uh, was in 2010. Uh, the um, attack called uh, Stuxnet, which was against the uh, nuclear stations in Iran, okay, by attacking the, the SCADA or the control systems that, that had the control on, on, on the nuclear stations. Then in 2015, there was uh, also a very famous attack in uh, Ukraine that actually caused a blackout on the, on the electricity system because they blocked the, the electricity distribution systems. And even last year, 2021, there was this attack with a colonial pipe in the United States that blocked uh, gas distribution across the east coast of, of the United States. And it was like two weeks without the ability to distribute the, the gas. Obviously, this, these are the main targets. It is true that being, for instance, uh, as I was saying, ATMs, uh, critical systems, and providing uh, essential services, we've heard in some uh, forums that they could be targets as, as uh, in, in the hybrid war uh, in the sense of, you know, blocking or disrupting these services. Obviously, in that case, uh, the type of attack that we've heard of, it will not be the jackpotting, obviously. It will be more, uh, you know, in, in the direction of the ransomware. I don't know if you're familiar with ransomware, but this is this, like, hijacking the, the device uh, so that you block uh, absolutely uh, the operations, okay? so. It's not, we don't have evidence of that, but uh, I mean, in certain circles, uh, there are rumors that this might be used as a, as a sort of cyber weapon in, uh, you know, in, in state conflicts. 
So what should we what should we be looking out for? I suppose you know you talked about the um, the basis of sort of much of modern computing still coming from the 1940s. Um, how what is happening in computing to sort of try and rebuild security um, with a different kind of model? Yeah. Well, as as you can imagine, this is a, this is a, a tough task, right? Because uh, so everything now is based on these basic technologies. So the, the von Neumann architecture, the operating system and subsequent layers, the TCP IP communications, and that's not going to change. Okay. Well, there might be a change with uh, you know this quantum computing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but uh, I mean this is going to stay here for decades. Okay. So changing the, the basics or the, 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 the root of the problem is, is not going to be uh, an alternative. Okay? So you need to look at it in a different way. Okay? And that's where this concept of uh, zero trust uh, is, is coming into place. Okay? And so in practice, what does, what does zero trust mean for, for, for banking, for the ATM world? Yeah. So zero, zero trust is, uh, well, it, it is, is one of those uh, trendy uh, terms in, in cybersecurity nowadays. Okay. Uh, actually, it comes from the, from the IT uh, world, uh, information, uh, in, uh, information technologies, information security. Um, zero trust appeared as, let's say, a, as a paradigm shift um, in, the, in the former perimetral security. So initially, the security of the companies was uh, assuming that the threats were outside the perimeter and that everything that is inside the perimeter can be trusted. Okay? And that was, let's say, like the, the full uh, philosophy of the firewalling, VPN systems, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But nowadays, we're, we're in a context where data is everywhere. So data is not only inside the company. Data is in the cloud, it's in the hybrid infrastructures. Uh, the workers are everywhere, so they do not only work from the office. They work in mobility. They work from home with VPN, uh, uh, teleworking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, so obviously the the perimeter uh, has disappeared. It's not there anymore. Okay, and therefore you need you need to think of new ways or new strategies for uh, defending your assets, your valuable assets. Okay, because the valuable assets are those that the threat actors will go after. Okay, and the zero trust model is a model that is based on, um, basic, basically it says never trust, always verify. Okay? So it's based on the principle that you need to think that your infrastructure is compromised. Okay? And then build your cybersecurity <coughs> strategy upon that assumption. Okay? Um, obviously, uh, you need to do uh, a number of things um, to control um, the security of your full in infrastructure. Okay, um, zero trust, as I was saying, it comes from the IT world. Okay, but if you translate it to OT, which is the operational technologies, critical devices, which, by the way, is where the um, uh, self-service devices or ATMs stand. Okay, um, any cybersecurity approach for those devices uh, needs to be based on the principles of zero trust. Okay. So assume that your infrastructure is going to be uh, compromised. Okay? Assume that you can only trust what you can verify. Okay? And apply that level of strong security uh, to your systems. Okay. So from Auriga's perspective, what does that mean in practice for, for like the architecture of your, of your solutions, how you approach building solutions for, for banks in, this, in the security domain? Yeah. So the... Um, well, I should say that, that obviously it's zero trust is, is a marketing term. It's very nice, but obviously you cannot have zero trust. Okay? You need to have a reduced or a limited, uh, as, as, as much limited as possible, um, trusted core. Okay? And, uh, and, 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 and the, 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 the actual thing is, is how you define this trusted core. Okay? And what this trusted core is comprised of. Um, when, we, when we're talking about the self-service devices and, and the ATMs, okay, the trusted core needs to be minimal okay? and needs to be comprised of the minimal set of software that, you can, uh, that actually the device needs to operate, 
the minimal set of hardware that the device needs to operate, and the minimal set of authorized accesses to the device, okay, which could potentially make changes on the device itself. Okay, so when it comes to minimal set of software, um, obviously, um, so let's say an ATM, right? An ATM, it has what is called a software image. Okay, so a software image is like a set of uh, different software layers starting from the operating system, the service providers, the application, monitoring system, etc., etc. In every dif in every customer, there's like a different combination of these layers. Okay, and uh, these layers. Uh, again, because of the complexity of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the computer architectures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they have lots of things that you don't really need for the operation. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is to strip off those things. Okay, so you need to find out what is the actual minimal software that you require for the operation, and the rest should be uh, instantly blocked. Okay, how can you identify this software? Okay. There is always a certification phase okay, that any company does for this image that uh, you need to certify and then you need to deploy it on uh, production ATMs. Okay? So you need to couple that certification process with the definition of the security policy because it's in that process where you identify what is that minimum software. Okay? Another important thing is um, changes. Okay? You have certified this, um, let's say, image with the minimal soft software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You spec to deploy it on the ATMs, and you spec that those ATMs have exactly what you've certi what you have certified. Okay. Uh, but obviously, this is. I mean, there are different actors that uh, you know participate in all this process. Okay, and and, and usually there are even third-party actors, right? Like the you know. Um, uh, on-site um, uh, technicians that do the deployment or uh, the systems that distribute updates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you need to understand the full ecosystem, okay, and actually uh, know what you you can trust and what you cannot. By default, you shouldn't trust any changes, okay. By default, what you have certified is what needs to be deployed on ATMs. So nobody should be able to modify it, okay. Who can modify it? Well. What I, what I call the trusted sources. Okay, if you've got, for instance, a system that does a remote software distribution, obviously you should trust that system to make updates. But not every update. <coughs> you should again think that your systems are compromised. So think that your software distribution system is compromised. Okay, so you should not only control the software distribution system, but also the software package that is being deployed. So that if your software distribution attempts to deploy a package that is not certified by you, is not trusted by you, then you should block it. Okay? Same goes with uh, local actions on the ATMs. You have these third-party companies okay, that are doing the on-site maintenance activities, and they have privileged access, physical access, and privileged access to the ATMs. Okay? So they have access to the internals, they have access to the operating system, they have access to the operator panel, so you need to restrict and control that. Okay? For us, in, in our approach, there is, it, 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 it all comes down to the understanding that an ATM can only be in two states. Okay? It can only be in production, providing the service, or under maintenance. Okay. When it comes to defining security policy, obviously you cannot have one policy for all. Okay? You need to have one policy when the ATM is in production, a different policy when the ATM is undergoing maintenance. When the ATM is in production, basically the only one that should be accessing the ATM is the end customer. You should think uh, that the end customer can be an attacker. Okay? And if he can be an attacker, you should block any actions on the ATM. Okay? In terms of hardware, in terms of software, anything. Okay? When you are on, uh, on the um, on-site maintenance activities, you have this third-party uh, field technician. Okay? But this is someone that, in most cases, you cannot trust. Okay? <laughs> so you need to let him do what he needs to do, but you also need to monitor what he's doing and actually approve the changes. So even if he's you know, manipulating hardware, what if, for instance, uh, he connects a rogue device and then uh, you know you can uh, connect to that rogue device and get control of the ATM. You need to know that. Okay, 
what if he's replacing a device and he's replacing with uh, not with the right device or you need to have uh, the, the monitor and the control of of, uh, of of those activities okay we're nearly out of time but I do have one final question uh, when we see banks adopting kind of new service models so um, ATMs with maybe remote video um, functionality for the customer or we see an increasing number of countries where there are sort of multi-bank ATM networks. Uh, can you, how do you manage this kind of model where you've got not only one financial institution but multiple where you've got different technologies and channels and, and connection methods always, always coming? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, 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 the business of the uh, you know, operation of uh, multi-bank networks, uh, obviously it's, it's a business that, I mean, the financial institutions outsource those uh, operations because of uh, uh, cost reduction. Okay, it's more effective, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it also has uh, another benefit, which is in terms of security. In terms of security, you're transferring the risk. Okay, because whoever operates that network is going to be responsible for the security of that network. Okay, so if you are operating a multi-bank network, you need to understand that security is your responsibility, okay? So, so you better make sure that you have, you know, a robust strategy in place, okay? Because at the end of the day, it's gonna be on you, okay? Same thing happens with uh, new models like the next-gen branch with, uh, you know, those devices that uh, automate operations in the branch for customers, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And these technologies are competing with other channels in the bank, like the online banking, et cetera, et cetera, right? The online banking, you, as a, as a user of the online banking, you have your part of responsibility on the security because you are accessing from your device. That's your mobile, okay? So your mobile might be infected, might have malware. So you have part of the responsibility. It's a responsibility, let's say, that the bank has delegated on you and maybe you're not prepared for that and then arguably we could discuss whether this is a good thing or not, but that's, that's the case. When we talk about the next in branch, okay, uh, the customer goes there, and even if it is all automated devices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these are devices that are owned and protected by the bank. Okay, so that sense of trust for the customer is there. Okay, because they know that they are using the systems that have been provided and secured by the bank, and I have no, not the, the slightest, uh, you know, responsibility uh, if, in the case that there should be a, an attack. So that's also an important thing. Super. Uh, Juan Ormón, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, thank you very much for coming here again and okay. uh, to Origa for your support of uh, the conference. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor, for um, helping build uh, a picture of just how fundamental this uh, zero trust approach looks to be. Um, I hope you can now join me in uh, giving a special welcome to uh, our speaker who has travelled quite some distance, all the way from Guatemala, um, from 5B. Uh, we're joined now by Marco Mejia, who's going to build on this zero trust approach to talk about a specific case study. Please welcome him to the stage. Uh, hello. Uh, well, nice to be here. Thank you, Auriga, to let us share our case. And this is a nice event. We are very happy to be here. Uh, so, uh, uh, one question. Uh, how many of the audience is uh, technical or IT persons? Uh, maybe you can raise your hand. All right, and non-IT or no technical person? Okay, well balanced, yeah. Just to, for use the terms, so thank you. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, we are uh, working uh, now in a, in a project. Right now, it's uh, the first year of this project. Uh, we think it's, it's very nice because uh, uh, the company invested uh, very much uh, in trying to defend our ATMs. So uh, it's a use case. But maybe you, you can uh, uh, get some ideas or some, some, uh, some uh, approaches that we used. So I uh, think it's, it's maybe useful for you. Yeah, well, uh, the agenda for this, uh, sorry, uh, is uh, who we are, a little description to, to, to understand the ecosystem that we are, are dealing with. 
Uh, actually, we are a, a company integrated by five banks. Uh, uh, five banks integrated uh, their operations in one company, and they transfer all the responsibilities related to ATMs to this company. And they, uh, they do the best they do. And we uh, move all the transactions from the ATMs. Uh, especially we are uh, transactions in all Central America, but uh, Guatemala is the, the, the biggest one. Uh, now we are seven <laughs> banks partners. We should be seven, seven B. So, but, but now it's five B. Uh, we we move a lot of transactions of any kind, any kind of transactions so in, in every state of security. Uh, we have a, a very commitment with security because it's a requirement of the, the of the, uh, the I'm sorry of the CEO. CEO required a very strong security in all operation. And uh, very hard certified uh, in the main industry uh, uh, standards uh, that that, uh, that support admission. It's that's our ecosystem. Sorry. Uh, the infrastructure of ATMs, I think, is uh, quite equal uh, in the most part of the world. Uh, uh, private connections, uh, uh, the the main brands that maybe are the, the main brands of the world, uh, the world needs for. Uh, Etc. So we have uh, a deployment of these technologies, uh, and uh, we have a, f a full high availability uh, design. Windows is our core operating system uh, by the moment. So uh, we are uh, dealing with this infrastructure. Well, but le let's see what we are dealing with. Uh, we actually started with uh, our known network. What well, we say our known network is uh, we connect our, our, uh, all our ATMs with two different service providers. Uh, we know the service providers are secure, but we don't really know. Uh, we have uh, even uh, software uh, this developed by many companies inside our company, and we have our old development team. It's an sometimes. Uh, uh, vulnerability design, uh, associated with developers or, or something by, by unknown uh, utilities used by our programmers. We have an uh, unknown operational health. Uh, this refers to an ecosystem, uh, the environment of all those technologies uh, working together. Uh, and then uh, on the fine core technologies. Uh, these were the four uh, main variables that we were uh, approaching with this uh, project because uh, when we try to uh, implement something uh, for long term that deal with all, all these cyber, uh, cyber security, physical and logical attacks, uh, we can do it just be with technologies, investing more technology, more people, more uh, security operation centers, and more and more and more. We can deal with that. It should be treated with, with intelligence, we think in that, and, and should be uh, dealt with a framework. Uh, we call it a framework. Uh, and those are the, the main variables. Well, an object the objective of this project was to uh, understand the, the concept or trusted core, uh, what mentioned by Juan, uh, what the, that concept. But trusted core in, in every company is different, yeah. For every, uh, for every, uh, for example, for a low low technology company, a trusted core may be a, a GBA administrator, a person, or a, a core database or a firewall. It depends. It depends. Uh, but in our case, uh, trying to identify that trusted core that that could be integrated by technology, processes, people, uh, it's, it's it's key. It's key for us. So. The project tried to, to point that trusted core to implement a starting point for uh, zero trust. Uh, in the technology world, uh, when we talk, OK, uh, as Juan mentioned, mentioned uh, attackers are outside in the north. Safe is here, the south. It's OK. North, north east, uh, sorry, uh, north, south uh, traffics, it's easy for everyone, uh, firewalls and, and everything. But when we talk uh, traffic from east to west, this server talking to this server, this database with this database. But if someone compromised this database, what happened to the second one? Is trusted or not? It's not trusted. 
So the, the problem is, is a little bigger. No, not only users touching much databases, but we can have uh, a web server infected or a component server infected or a firewall infected because everything is software in, nowadays. So if you, if, you, if you think about that, it's a very complex problem because every time you get in the network a new device, Internet of Things, borderless networks, uh, it gets very complex, very complex. So that we try to do. Identify, first of all, uh, identify the business drivers because uh, we as technology, uh, as the technology guys, we can break <laughs> broke a, a enterprise buying a lot of things we don't need. If we only buy, 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 the budget of the IT infrastructure, security infrastructure, uh, gets bigger and, and don't solve anything. Yeah, that's a, a, it's not a good point. So we, we need to identify those drivers. Uh, then uh, we need to identify, I think, uh, for, for me, the, the, the most important part, which I'm responsible of, uh, quantify. Uh, yeah. This is important part. I, I am going to explain a little more in detail. Uh, quantify means the full understanding of the problem that you have in your networks. It's for every network is different. This understanding. Try to quantify means uh, behaviors. Every company behave uh, different from another. Uh, mean means and max of the users. What time they start to to connect to the network? What they do? What protocols? Everything uh, means a mean and max. Okay what time they use the email, uh, from where, etc. So, control zones. From a min and a max, it's a control zone. What's normal? Yeah, why a user is touching one server they have, they have never touched? Why? So, now, now I imagine you, you have a network of 5,000, uh, 100,000 users connected everywhere. A network bigger, uh, data centers in the cloud. Uh, it's a very, very complex. So we can manage, as a professional, IT professional, it's impossible to manage that. So that's why uh, I, well, when I was in studying engineering, I had a course uh, in mathematics, mathematics uh, called multivariable system. So now I understand where, where those, model, those models has a, a practical, uh, use <laughs> many years ago, but now I understand. So we need uh, to uh, to deal with that uh, with uh, with a nice design of this uh, mathematical te theory. That's uh, that's the bonding part of all all those things you you can read there. Then uh, define and define means the business implemented in the model and using all the technology, all those three steps. So, the solution. Uh, uh, we did a four-year project. Uh, actually, we are the, the second one. Uh, this is uh, the, the roadmap. It's, it's, it's very challenging because, uh, <laughs> you know, as professionals, uh, we, we can only work in that. We have to do supply orders, to do some management, and the time related to this for every po uh, position, it's hard. So this is the, the my main project design. Uh, we have uh, the trusted variables defined uh, at this point. This means uh, we need uh, this understanding. We, we are working with trusted sources because it's, it's key for us to use uh, uh, this, this variable design. So we need the technology to support that variable design. We, we can do it uh, just with uh, Excel tables or, or, or data in, 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 a big, uh, in a big data model. No, we need to define it with so, uh, trusted sources of information. Uh, then we need, uh, for the second year, uh, uh, objective is to uh, take all data and implement the zero trust baseline model. So the second year, uh, we're trying then to integrate all the information, uh, try to identify the zero trust model, and define that behavior. 
uh, as a technical, I, I would say this is the, the, the key part. Because uh, behavior, imagine you have that, that database infected, uh, integrated with all other databases inf uh, not infected. For, for me as an administrator, of course that is a, a secure, as a, as a trusted element. But what I do if sometime that behavior changes? But because it's the same user, same privileges, same data, same transactions. What, what defines me if that, that uh, trusted uh, server, it's, 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 uh, it's a trusted server, it's behavior. So for us in cybersecurity, we can trust anything, but what are the, the, uh, the variables that let us trust something? For us, uh, it's uh, these baselines. The baselines, the baseline that means these variables, this behavior, it's you, and it's your, your, your sign. Uh, even you have that name, etc. cetera, it's, it's your sign. For example, a, a, a normal trans database transaction, it's out of the, of the, the, of the baseline. So we are, we are using that part, and then we are going to automize all this. Uh, for the non-IT persons, it's impossible for an engineer to protect an enterprise without automation, full automation. Cybersecurity is full automated. It can be something in a seat with a person sleeping on it. So, or with a firewall with few entrances. Uh, no, uh, it, it has to be full automated. It's because uh, we talked before uh, of a multivariable environment. So it's impossible for, for a human try to deal with all of that information, many variables, many systems in a borderless, a borderless uh, ecosystem. So it's mandatory, this should be zero trust automation because it uh, should be uh, in rules to, to be trusted, but in one moment, if you are not trusted because you don't comply that rule, you, that you are trusted, you are out of the trust, yeah, dynamically. Uh, there are a lot of technologies to implement that, VLAN, dynamic VLAN, VXLANs, uh, a lot of uh, networking technologies to support that, performance routing, uh, many, many, many technologies uh, to support that. So that's the final stage, automate this thing. I think it's going to be a mix of many technologies and many local deployments. Well, uh, important for us uh, in this uh, in initial state of rate is uh, to use uh, for our, our ITM ecosystem uh, trusted data because uh, in the ATMs goes uh, financial information that we can uh, took uh, as a technical people. So we need to uh, use exactly the old information that is useful, uh, useful for uh, the cybersecurity operation. It's very different than financial, financial operation. Sometimes the financial people say, don't touch that. The, the product owner or the, the data owner say, don't touch that. We don't need the, informa the financial information. We need the cybersecurity information. So uh, LookWise, uh, LookWise is a nice uh, software that we are uh, having a new center company and extracts exactly that, that kind of information uh, and let us uh, use exactly what we need. And, uh, letting apart the financial information, right? right? Uh, so, Jan, we are using a combination of few CM technologies. Uh, a few of them are open. Uh, we are trying to deal with multivariate system in, in, the, in, the, in the CM technologies. CM technologies are, are very nice. You can deploy your own models and you can uh, uh, make your multivariable uh, model implementing in a system. So then we use LookWise as a data source, and we have in data center many other uh, collectors. Then we integrate many CM technologies to implement the variable system and try to establish uh, the use cases for all the systems and the variables that we have. Uh, and then we have the core trust baselines. Core trust baseline because in one moment, one core have a number of devices, maybe a second later, another number. 
because one of them may be fail the baseline design that we, that we made, okay? A virus can, can make a computer behave very different in every moment to another. So uh, if the baseline says, okay, now heuristics out, okay? That's the design rule there. And by the end, uh, for a matter of time, uh, first of all, uh, zero trust requires a clear understanding of a zero trust core. Must be dynamical, and it's not a static thing, this server and this server and that other server, and that's it, no, no, no. It's a dynamical uh, model. Uh, then uh, uh, we, uh, we need to represent a, uh, a variable model that represents the business. It shouldn't be something that a technician designed for the business and said, ah, it's this and that. No, 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 no. This is built with data owners, business owners, that for the model to represent the high uh, valuable, valuable um, resources in the enterprise. So then, uh, the baselines is, 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 is a key for understand the, the heuristics of all the model. And then zero trust, which, which is our uh, actual practice of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I blocked that part. So, uh, not trust everything, just uh, require the privilege you need dynamically. So, uh, uh, sorry, 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 <laughs> next chip. So, this is our conclusion by the moment. Uh, uh, we hope to, to finish this project. And uh, uh, I think f for me, uh, conceptual like this for the company, for the CEO, was, uh, is the battle is, win is, is won because the CEO knows it. And, and, and at least uh, they understand the model and what is happening in their company, the, 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 the variables, and the, the definition of trust. For me, the, 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 the battle is won, even if the project don't get at, the, at his end. So, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, this is our first experience. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco. We've just got um, a couple of minutes. Um, if anyone does have a question at all from the floor, um, I was just going to ask one uh, myself. Um, so you're, I, I appreciate it's a network, but you've got uh, seven member banks. Yes. Yeah. Right now, we are integrating uh, more, more, more interested uh, associate, associates. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, has the fact that you've got seven member banks has that uh, made it difficult to establish one single zero trust baseline? Has it made it difficult because you have, you know, banks yeah, with different, that's a very different good question. hardware and yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, techn technological for us as a technical is easier to make, to build many contexts as you wish. So it's very easy. But uh, shared resources, uh, but you can certify, you can uh, uh, pay five databases, five licenses, five PCI security uh, uh, audit, uh, audits. Uh, so uh, by the moment, it's, it, it's not uh, uh, economically uh, possible. So. Uh, we, we have, in some places, we, we have the resources to do it. It's separated, totally, uh, transactions, but not, not in everything. We, we don't have yet in place uh, separation of services. So, but at the moment, some parts, maybe 60% is uh, shared, 40 separated. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a, it's a view of, of the IT team to make this uh, separation uh, a reality. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But uh, today, I, uh, I, there are many converged uh, technologies, uh, in network terms, etc., to separate tunnels. Uh, it don't, uh, it don't worth it to separate physical channels. So right. today, we have technology that, that shouldn't be separated because it's, uh, the, the logical technologies are doing, deal with, dealing with everything over there. Very yeah. good. Thanks, yeah. Marco. Thomas, yeah. any other questions? No. Okay. So um, many thanks once again, Marco, for sharing your yeah. case study. Thank you for such a long way. Thank you.